In 1892, Dmitry Ivanovsky filtered a solution of a tobacco plant, attempting to isolate the disease infecting it. He utilized a newly invented filter that had pores smaller than a bacteria. So he was surprised to find that the extract continued to remain infectious after filtration. What Dmitry had inadvertently discovered was an infectious agent thousands of times smaller than a bacteria, a virus. But what is a virus? Curious to find out more, I paid a visit to the University of Bristol's Biomedical Science Building. It's quite an unusual agent because it's a bit debatable really whether it's alive or not. It's essentially a piece of genetic material, so DNA or RNA encased in a protein coat. It's got some characteristics of being alive, so it has genetic material, it's able to replicate and it can actually evolve as well. But then at the same time, it doesn't have any kind of cellular structure and it relies on having a host to replicate, so it can't actually do that on its own. It's much, much smaller than a bacterium. How small are we talking? Um, so we're talking, say, around 100 nanometers. Wow. So we couldn't see them through traditional means with a, a microscope or anything like that? No, you wouldn't be able to see them with a light microscope. You'd be able to use an electron microscope, um, which is something that gives you very high resolution images of very, very small things. So if these viruses are too small for us to see, how might we best visualize these deadly diseases? The idea for glass microbiology came from reading newspapers about the latest pandemics and each story had a, a photograph in there of perhaps HIV or swine flu used to illustrate those stories. Those images of the viruses were often brightly coloured but viruses don't have any colour so they're smaller than the wavelength of light itself. So I wanted to make these colourless three-dimensional objects to represent a virus. And by making them in, in glass, it also kind of creates a problem in that the, the sculptures we end up with are incredibly beautiful. And that creates a tension between the, the beauty of the object and then what it represents. So, you know, you're kind of drawn to this sculpture of, a, of HIV, for instance, and then you realize what it is, and then you're slightly repelled to it by it. And that kind of creates a tension that I'm interested in as an artist. These beautiful sculptures help us to understand what these infectious agents might look like on a big scale. But despite their small size, these microbes can have a big impact on our planet. I'm a biogeochemist, so I look at how microbes can influence the nutrient cycling uh, in the environment. So, and I, in my case, I particularly look at um, glaciers, polar regions and Alps. And, uh, okay. What kind of polar regions do you go to? So, uh, we do a lot of field work in Greenland and then in Svalbard. Wow. And uh, we go to the Alps and Iceland. What are you sort of looking for if you're going to a glacier? What's going to draw your attention to a particular area? Usually, I'm always looking for the dark patches on the ice because the dark patches are often is going to be full of microbes and the ice is full of those dark patches. Really? We are starting to believe that actually the dark patches are formed by the microbes themselves. Maybe there are a small amount of particles land on the ice and then they trigger the, the microbial growth and then you have a lot of microbial growth around the particles and that drives even further the melting of the ice. We believe that this is a significant effect on the Greenland ice sheet actually and provide the extra melting of water from Greenland. And those dark patches, so you, it's thought that perhaps that's actually the, the microbes themselves, that there are so many microbes there that they start to become visible to the naked eye in, oh, in that sort of scale. In that sort of scale, yes. And I can show you a few pictures actually, that yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the sort of thing that, you, that we're talking about. Is that a factor in global warming and climate change or? So we are trying to link those two factors. So the interesting thing is that if you combine both the temperature increase that we can see on the planet, doesn't justify all the melting that you actually see. There's actually more melting happening than is justified by the increase in temperature. But when you put the temperature and then the darkening of the ice together, and then you can justify that extra melting that you actually see from Greenland. So it's a combination of those yes. two things that is actually accelerating yeah. the melting itself. And somehow global warming is 
probably have an uh, impact on this it's in accelerating that melting and accelerating that darkening as well. Mm -hmm. So actually in this sort of what we might consider a, an extreme environment in these cold regions there can be a whole ecosystem of microorganisms. Oh yes yeah so we, we have actually we even now consider the glaciers and ice sheets as a biome just like the tropical forest is a biome. It's interesting because so many of the viruses that we sort of come to understand in recent decades are driven by human diseases, but actually the majority of viruses don't infect humans, is that right? That's absolutely right. So actually 99.99% .99 of all viruses on Earth probably are impacting, they are infecting bacteria. So they are the most dominant type of virus that you see in the environment. So they are completely harmless for us and they might even have actually a positive impact for us because they might, you can use virus, for example, to tackle bacterial diseases. When it comes to microbes, they are occupying almost every niche on Earth. As long as you have water, liquid water, I think there's no place on earth that they have not been found. It's never too hot, it's never too cold, it's never too acidic, it's never too basic. They are everywhere and they have been here for the last 3.5 billion years and they are still responsible for about half of the oxygen on, on earth that we breathe comes from the oceans by microbes. So they, they have shaped our planets. These organisms have been on the planet for, for billions of years but as to how they came about, that yeah. still remains well, a great mystery. Yeah, so how are virus equally old as the bacteria? We don't know, actually. I mean, it's, uh, is it, um, did they evolve from a bacterium that it's actually lost a lot of genetic material and then they became a virus? So it's virus something that it's uh, com evolved completely independently? Um, no, it, it's a lot of uh, speculation about how they evolved and how they how they originated in our planet. And that's something we still don't know the answer to. Oh, not really. There's yeah. a, quite a few heated debates okay. about it. <laughs> Virology conferences. Yes, I can <laughs> In a little over a hundred years since the discovery of viruses, we've learned about their composition, how they multiply, how they infect host cells, and even how an agent so small that we can't see it with a microscope can influence the ecosystems of our planet. But despite all of these achievements, there's still much that remains a mystery about these fascinating structures. Thank you to everyone who helped to make this video possible. If you enjoyed it, please share, subscribe, and check out our previous videos. Thanks for watching. Oh, hold on, I'm just gonna wait for the camera. Okay.